Hello and welcome to the Apologetics 315 podcast with your hosts Brian Auten and Chad Gross. Join us for conversations and interviews on the topics of apologetics, evangelism, and the Christian worldview. You're right, no human being would stack books like this. All right, Chad, welcome to the podcast. We're here for another episode of Can Samples. Uh, last week, we talked to him about the first half of his book, and this week, talking to him about the second half. Well, I'm looking forward to it because this this part is is really, I think, kind of the heart of where a lot of the questions, especially uh, about Christianity, are coming from, which is, you know, not only we talked in the first part about is Christianity true? Uh, now we're kind of going to look at that question of is Christianity good? Uh, and is it a good religion? Uh, is it a is it a force for good in the world? And so I think that's where a lot of people are asking questions nowadays. So I, hopefully it'll be helpful. If you're just finding us uh, here and uh, haven't listened to part one yet, that's in the feed. So go back and listen to it. You could probably listen to this one by itself without the other one, I'm sure. But why not listen to both? So uh, if you weren't with us last week, this is a Christian philosopher, Ken Samples. He's also a theologian and apologist. Very well orbed, wouldn't you say, Chad? Oh, he's fully, <laughs> fully, fully orbed. Uh, he's a senior research scholar at Reasons to Believe. Today's part two, talking to Ken about his newest book, Christianity Cross-Examined. Is it rational, relevant, and good? Let's get ready. Switch me on. All right, well, thanks for joining us again, Ken. And uh, it's been great talking to you about, uh, you know, the first part of the, the book last week. We're excited to talk about this next section, which, as we said last week, uh, you know, you mentioned how people are asking more questions than just, is, it, is Christianity true, but is it good? Is it, is it appealing? Is it helpful? We, we want to dive right into that. What are the main things that you're seeing that people are asking? Yeah, I think that uh, the new atheists uh, often bring up, uh, in light of 9-11, how about killing in the name of God? Uh, a lot of times that's focused toward Islam, but there are, there are many atheists today who say, wait a second. Uh, what about the, the Crusades? What about the Inquisition, the Salem Witch Trial, 30 Years War? Hasn't Christianity been violent? And is, is that a good thing? And of course, today, um, maybe unlike uh, in the ancient and medieval world where people would ask questions about truth, goodness, and beauty, people ask questions like, well, what about Christianity's relationship to slavery? Has Christianity been good for African Americans? Has it been good for women? Uh, so that issue is raised. And as you mentioned, of course, Dawkins specifically says that the that Yahweh, the God of the Old Testament, is just the worst individual. He calls it in fiction to ever be thought of. But there are those questions when you read the Old Testament. What about Joshua's wars against the Canaanite? Another issue that is very important to me is the question about why is Christianity so divided? I mean, I gave a, a presentation one time at a university, and afterwards an atheist came up to me and he said, you know, I kind of like the way you reason, but if I were to become a Christian, which Christianity? You guys can't agree. It seems hopelessly divided. And then, of course, kind of the standard um, questions that never go away. What about hypocrisy? You know, people say, I like Christ, but I don't like Christians. They're so difficult. So those are some of the issues that I think the new atheists are very skilled at kind of laying out. And I, I really did think, and, and I, I guess if there is kind of a unique feature of, of this book, it is trying to touch on both of the themes. Is it rational? And how do we, how do we respond to the challenges that it's not, it hasn't been good? Yeah, you mentioned, you know, that how those questions are shifting. And one of the issues you bring up is slavery. It's a very popular objection right now. What, what do you think the best approach is for believers to discuss this topic topic with skeptics? And what are some things you could say to skeptics to kind of maybe help help them think about that in a bit of a different way? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, during the pandemic, and the unrest in various cities about, uh, you know, racial issues, this is right at the forefront. I think, that, Chad, there's a couple things I would say. 
One is, I think if you look at history, slavery was practiced by every ancient civilization, uh, by the Egyptians, by uh, the Greeks, by the Romans. Slavery doesn't seem to necessarily be a European problem. It seems to be a human problem. Slavery in the, in the ancient world was as common as, you know, economics. So I begin there. And then, then I think I would say that a lot of times when somebody like Dawkins or Hitchens, when they see words like bondservant in the Old Testament, they say, well, that slavery, I'm going to equate that slavery with the slave trade in Great Britain and in the antebellum South. And they equate uh, slavery or indentured servitude in the Old Testament as being the very same thing as, as what we find in the antebellum South. And I, I want to make a case that that's a misunderstanding of it, that in the Old Testament, there were people who would work for other people, and, and they did call them master, but it was not based on race. The people could work a period of time and uh, get their freedom. And even people that were captured by the, by the Hebrews in warfare, those people could become free. And some of them even became part of the nation of Israel. I would want to make the case that you have to be very careful about reading into the Old and New Testament concepts that were held in other places. I think, I, Chad, I would also want to convey, however, that I think it's the message of the Bible, the Judeo-Christian Bible, that says all human beings bear the image of God. And because they be, their image bears, they have dignity and value. The sanctity of human life comes out of this Jewish idea that Christians adopt mm. and spread around the world and if you look in, in uh, Europe, in, in Britain, and in America, so many of the leading abolitionists were Christians, and they were arguing along these lines that people, regardless of their race, their, their sex, their class, their uh, place of origin, their health, their age, they have dignity and they have value. You know, it's interesting when you think of the ancient world, because I would argue, for example, it's hard to find a greater philosopher than Aristotle. I mean, his competition is not very large. He is that great a philosopher. But did you know that Aristotle believed in slavery? He thought Greeks were superior to non-Greeks. You know, um, the Romans thought non-Romans were inferior. The two largest people groups to join Christianity in the first and second centuries were women and slaves. Why? Because both women and slaves heard a message that told them they had value, they had dignity, that God loved them and had provided a way of them being reconciled to God. And so, you know, if Christians in the first century would have said, well, look, Christianity, Christianity has to stop slavery. Well, Christians didn't have a lot of power in those early days. They, they, may be a, they may have to fight with the Romans for something like that. But I think ultimately it's the values of the Bible that led to slavery being outlawed in most parts of the world. And so, yes, it is, it is unfortunate, and, it, and slavery was a terrible evil. And I even think of one of my um, American philosophical heroes, Jonathan Edwards, his son was an abolitionist and his right-hand man in ministry was an abolitionist, but Edwards just couldn't quite see the slavery issue clearly enough. So all of us have deep moral blind spots. And if, and if you put me back into the antebellum South, or if you put me in ancient Rome or in ancient Athens, I might adopt those prejudicial uh, ideas very much. But I think Christianity has an extraordinary message about uh, freeing people, both from chains and from the slavery of sin. Hmm. Amen. Yeah, just for a technical point, in the book, for listeners' benefit, uh, there, are, there are various tables 
throughout the chapters that kind of break down the main points that um, Ken is making. And there's an especially helpful one in this chapter. Uh, many of them are, but uh, it's called 10 Ways uh, Servant Slavery in Israel Differed from the slavery that, of course, Dawkins and the New Atheists compare it to, and he gives 10 ways. And so that that I found that super helpful, just as something concise to kind of like copy and have in my Bible, you know, uh, just in, during conversations and stuff. So there's that's all through the book. So uh, just to commend that to listeners. Well, that's the teacher in me, always wanting to help people remember and utilize the data. And uh, yeah, so there's a lot of tables. Yeah. Yes, and they're very helpful. So killing in the name of God would be another sort of theme mm -hmm. that uh, you mentioned there. It's it's throughout the book. And, you know, you talk about the witch trials. And, 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 of course, you still hear people saying, well, if God told you to go sacrifice your son up on the mountain, would you do that? Uh, how, how, that's horrible and terrible. I downplay those objections because I disagree with them. But coming from the aspect of someone who is seeing you know, people going and shooting something up and saying, well, God told me to do that, or reading the Bible without any sort of background of education of of the symbolism and the things that are going on with, say, Abraham and his son. Wow, you know, well, what if God told you to murder someone? I mean, so th there are these concerns, and they're legitimate. So what what is the main angle that you would take in addressing those things that hey, there's a lot of stuff that's per perpetrated in the name of God. Therefore, religion generally and Christianity is in that category. It is not good. Um, look at all of the things that we happen. And then we, we take this laundry list, uh, which has terrible things in it that, that really does pull on your emotions, rightly so. Uh, what's the way that you'd respond to that? I, I think the place to begin is to say that uh, Christian history is messy. and there are. There are difficult and dark periods within Christian history, and there are there are times where Christians have done things that are not consistent with the teaching of Christ or or with the teaching of the Bible. Yet, Brian, when I begin looking at some of these events, I mean, I have a degree in history, and so I'm fascinated with the study of history. When I go back, for example, to the Crusades. And uh, I began reading some of the best historians in the field. What I discovered is that oftentimes critics of Christianity exaggerate the number of people killed in the Crusade. And they suggest that the Crusaders were out for money and land, and they were pillaging, and they were taking advantage of Muslims who were very peaceful, loving people. Well, what I have discovered is that in large measure, uh, the Crusades were challenging, but there are historians today who would say that the Crusades were largely a just war effort, that, it, that if Christian think, Christians had not united together in the West, Islam would have taken over all of Europe. And so this was a defensive war. It was not a war to pillage, to gain money, to gain land. It was very much a defensive war. Uh, and Christians, it, you know, Christian scholarship is in many ways very impressive. I mean, just war theory was developed by Augustine and Aquinas and various other thinkers who said, look, how can we apply Christian principles to warfare? When I move to some of these other issues, uh, the Inquisition, and I think, man, how could anything? That sounds terrible. Sounds like the Catholic Church were torturing uh, non Christians and Jews and Protestants. Well, there are historians writing today who say that the Inquisition has, in many ways, been it, there's a straw man created around it. That is, the Inquisition was in large measure emphasizing repentance. The church was encouraging people to move away from their sinful beliefs or their views of denying Christianity. And for example, within about 400 years of the Inquisition, only a couple thousand people died, as opposed to hundreds or millions. I mean, I've seen some of these numbers that are greatly exaggerated. 
there are historians today writing and saying, actually, there was uh, there was a sense of jurisprudence that was used in in the Inquisition. So I I, I I like to say I think that the dark side of Christianity is often exaggerated. And um, I would also, however, say if, if you want to blame some of the dark periods on Christianity, could I uh, then turn around and say in the 20th century, a hundred million people died at the hands of those who adopted a philosophy called dialectical materialism, communism. So Stalin was an atheist. Pol Pot was an atheist. Mao was an atheist. I mean, if you bring up the numbers, it, it, it's incredible the number of people who have died by I, secular ideologies in the 20th century. And I might even add this. I, I would add that a lot of times, you know, when I was a kid, I would hear a great deal about the the battles between Catholics and Protestants in Northern Ireland. And, you know, C.S. Lewis was born in Belfast. I think that's one reason why he emphasized mere Christianity. I think he wanted Christendom to be united. But, you know, Brian, um, I don't think if you go back to the hostility, and I'm not in any way trying to condone it or dismiss it, but I don't think Catholics were shooting at the Protestant and saying, Viva le Pope, and the Protestant would shoot back and say, no, sola scriptura. My point there is to say, I think a, large, a lot of it was political differences. Sometimes political differences are interpreted as religious differences. And I think it happens in the Middle East. It happens all over the place. So in my view, I think the new atheists exaggerate the negative things in history, and often they're not willing to accept the idea that secularism, I mean, after all, to be a communist, part of your philosophical system is atheism. And why couldn't, if, if there's no God, if the world is a blind, mechanistic, brute reality, and Stalin says, look, uh, in order to gain our communist goals, we have to bump off people. Now, you might not agree with that as an atheist, but who's to say? That's kind of the way I tackle that issue, saying that, yeah, Christians are not immune from bloodshed, but uh, there are a lot of uh, historians, Rodney Stark at Baylor, he has uh, written things about uh, history arguing that these dark periods in Christian history are often deeply exaggerated in the negative. So, you know, in talking about the, the violence done uh, in the name of God, you, of course, address the, the violence in your book as well that supposedly is done by God himself. So specifically here, I'm talking about God's command to the Israelites to drive out or kill, de depending on your interpretation. Right. Uh, the Canaanite, the Canaanites. And you mentioned some of the more relevant passages in your book. Uh, and when the Lord, your God, has delivered them over to you and you have defeated them, then you must destroy them totally. Make no treaty with them and show them no mercy. That's in Deuteronomy. And then, of course, Joshua 621 says they devoted the city to the Lord and destroyed with the sword every living thing in it, men and women, young and old, cattle, sheep. And donkeys. So, Chris, you know, we have uh, people like Jerry Coyne claiming that the God of the Bible commanded many genocides. Uh, now, I love the way in the book how you break down the kind of two of the prominent ways of, of dealing with this problem the displacement view and the judgment view. And uh, feel free to unpack those if you want. But, but what I was wondering is when you're in a conversation with somebody and they're struggling with this issue. Do, do you think the best way to go about it is just to offer both of these views and to say, hey, here are a couple ways that Christians deal with these and kind of let them come down on what one they think best explains it? Or how would you recommend going about that? Well, and again, uh, this is not an not an easy issue. I think I think William Lane Craig says that 
the reason why, you know, the, the idea that God would order the Hebrews to utterly destroy the Canaanites, the reason we're so, that that's so uh, difficult for us to accept is because we've come to believe that God is a loving God, that God is a just God, that people have dignity and they have value. And so I don't in any way want to give people the impression that this is not a very challenging issue. But, but again, I think Christian scholars have approached it and said, well, uh, there are two ways we could look at this. I mean, uh, Paul Copan is a, is a friend. He's a philosopher. I really appreciate him. He takes the position that it was never the intention on the Israelites to, to totally destroy men, women, and children. Uh, rather, the goal was to, uh, to destroy the, the Canaanite religion, the system that involved child sacrifice, that involved uh, sex with animals. I mean, the Canaanites were reprobate. And Copan takes the position that what, what Joshua was to do was to destroy the religion and allow those people then the opportunity to repent and uh, to become part of uh, the believing community. Other scholars take a, a different position, and they, they see what Joshua did was a type of, uh, it was a death penalty. It was a mass executive action where uh, these people were so wicked that they needed to be removed. And of course, uh, Canaan would then become Israel. It would become the place of the birth of the Messiah. Now, I think there's a number of things that we can, we can say in this context. 400 years, there was preaching to the Canaanites to repent. I mean, there seems to be a pattern when God brings forth his wrath. He gives people a message that their actions are deplorable, their actions are immoral, and they need to stop. The Canaanites were not without warning that their actions were reprehensible. In, in addition to that, I think you could also say that God is in a very different position than we are. I mean, God gives life and he can take it. God is in a position where he makes these, these moral judgments about people. You know, I, I think the biggest issue is it comes down to, did they target non-combatant women and children? Did they, and, and if they did, isn't this inconsistent with the Old Testament and not even consistent with just war theory? Well, again, Paul, Paul Copan would say, no, they did not. They didn't attack non-combatants. Those who take the the other position, I think they would say that the Canaanite society was so reprobate, and uh, that even the women and the children were so corrupt that if they were allowed to live, they would corrupt society. They would corrupt the Jews. And uh, some would argue that. Uh, if the if the children are an issue that maybe in the next life they would be forgiven uh maybe you could bring a a theological argument that this was done without their consent but it but it does seem to me i think chad that we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that god is a moral being that god is a holy being and it is true that god brought forth the flood and it took, it took the life, death, and resurrection of the Son of God to save us from the wrath of God. So, um, I mean, the Canaanites were wicked people. So I think all of those kinds of things need to factor in to, to maybe illustrate. And of course, let's suppose God did not intervene. Then I think the, the, the new atheist would turn around and say, you mean God knew about all of that wickedness, and he never did anything about it. It's, it seems to me God is damned if he does and damned if he doesn't. I was just getting ready to say that. You took the words right out of my mouth. What do you think of, and, and this is just something I'm curious about. You, you don't take this tact in the book, um, but I'm curious as to what you think. 
One of, and by the way, uh, this kind of has a Bonsian flavor to it. You know, hopefully you'll see what I mean. And I also really enjoyed your talk online about understanding Greg Bonson. I think you gave it a few years back at one of the Bonson conferences or something. It was very, help, very helpful for me. But um, what would you say? I've seen apologists kind of take the tact of instead of addressing it in the way that you do uh, in saying, hey, here's a couple ways that Christians can think about this. and. Uh, either are are kind of you know acceptable or with within the umbrella of uh, orthodoxy or however you want to put it, uh, they'll say, well, in order for you to even object to that, you know, God has to exist because you're making a moral judgment, and in order to make a to say that God was it was wrong of God to kill the Canaanites, where do you get right or wrong from? Do you find do you find when discussing that issue that that's kind of a helpful way to go or would you go more with how you did in the book or maybe it would depend upon person to person I don't know. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um and of course, you know, Christians aren't all in agreement about their apologetic methodology. Some think that you know you make the case for God's existence my presuppositional friends, and I have many of them because I come from a reformed background, I, I think the presuppositionalists make some very important points. One of them being that none of us is neutral. All of us come to the issues of the day with pre-commitments. Um, I, I think as well, I think the point they're making there about the need to ground morality in God, I think is a very powerful one. I don't think you have to be a presuppositionalist to reason that way, but I think it is I think it is very reasonable to say, look, if if you are claiming that God was somehow unjust or that God carried out genocide, what is the basis for your moral thinking? And uh, in my view, I think the naturalist worldview, I think the secular naturalist worldview. I think they have primarily real problems in three areas. I think it's hard for them to explain reason and ground reason, difficult to ground meaning and purpose in life, and then thirdly, the topic we're talking about, morality. I think naturalism has real difficulty explaining those particular areas. And, you know, I, I think sometimes uh, those who adopt a more presuppositional approach, they think, hey, I want to get right down to, can you even make an objecting claim unless you already presuppose the moral truth of God? Now, I would tell you kind of humorously, you know, when I met John Warwick Montgomery, I became an evidentialist. When I met uh, Greg Bonson, I then thought, well, maybe I'll be a presuppositionalist. Then I met Geisler, and I thought, well, maybe I'll be a classical. <laughs> then I come to the conclusion, and I read five views of apologetics, and I thought, you know, we all have more in common than the areas in which we disagree. And I, I tend to think that maybe apologetic methodology has more to do with the different ways people think and approach issues. But I, I definitely think if you're a secularist, where do you ground morality? What, what, yeah. What's your starting place? So I'm a bit sympathetic to the way they do it, but I'm not, I'm not confined, I think, to maybe a, a presuppositional approach. Yeah, thank you. That was helpful. Ken, uh, one of the other things that you address in the book is um, the issue of hypocrisy within the church, maybe the imperfections of Christians or those who proclaim be Christians, leaders who fall into immoral behavior and uh, living double lives, for instance. And one helpful differentiation that I find in that section was where you, t you sort of differentiate between the lowercase hypocrisy and uppercase H hypocrisy, where, you know, one is, um, well, everybody's a hypocrite at some point. Uh, you know, that's lowercase where it's, but it's, it's, uh, it's not huge things. Whereas you've got hypocrisy with an uppercase H, um, where the uppercase is like, uh, now this is blatant. This is big. This is along the lines of, uh, living a double life and that kind of a thing where, um, it's a, it's a large moral trouble. 
I find that section helpful, but can you describe how you see a helpful approach in speaking to people about fallen Christian leaders, uh, people who proclaim Christ yet, you know, fail in various ways? I mean, that's obviously a, a big stumbling block. And if I just say one more thing about that is that, you know, even within the church, uh, that's a can cause people to leave Christianity because of lack of lost trust. And well, if I, I thought I could trust this person, but I can't, I can't trust them. And if they proclaimed it true, but it, they were living a double life. Well, I can't accept it true. You know, that's sort of, it's just, it's a trauma in many ways. So mm -hmm. talk about how you address that in the book and maybe we can unpack a few things there. Yeah. And I, Again, I want to say something similar. I mean, I've met people who um, they were deeply hurt by people in the church. I mean, that there are there's a reality to the fact that there have been clergymen who have uh, sexually assaulted people. Uh, it's happened in Catholicism. It's happened in Protestantism. It's happened in Orthodoxy. Uh, and so, I don't want in any way to uh, uh, not acknowledge the deep pain and the sorrow that people have had. I think, though, the way I I, I want to move forward on that would be, I would say, you know, um, human beings are deeply broken. Human beings are are wounded. And, you know, that's a biblical teaching. The Bible says that at the core of their being, people have moral flaws. Now. You know, in Eastern mystical religions, that's not necessarily so. I mean, you could be a pantheistic Hindu and think that you're actually God and you're suffering from amnesia. Or, uh, you know, you could adopt another worldview. I mean, I, I would like to know, um, how does a secular approach explain the flaws? Uh, for example, some fairly big name atheists have been criticized publicly for not treating women appropriately. So this flawedness and uh, the problem of sin seems to run throughout uh, all cultures and civilizations. And of course, that's one thing the Bible categorically teaches. We're sinners. We are broken. We're flawed. Uh, we need a savior. And I, I do think that... Um, I do think that for most Christians, I mean, you know, when I get up in the morning, I take a shower and uh, I often say to the Lord, Lord, just, you know, as this hot water and soap cleanses my body, I need you to cleanse my soul. Lord, I struggle with anger and envy and gluttony and greed and lust and pride and sloth. And Lord, I need your spirit to empower me. I need your forgiveness. I don't love my la my neighbor the way I should. I've been impatient with my wife. You know, I, I was driving to work and I yelled a bad word when somebody cut me off. Well, there is this process we call sanctification, where we while we have been redeemed, the Holy Spirit is in the process of changing us and transforming us. And I'm I'm not the way I was, but I'm not yet the way I want to be. I kind of talk about this hypocrisy as a lowercase h, that, that every, every Christian, and in fact, every person, none of us meet up to our moral ideals, except for one person. Houston Smith, the, the great distinguished world religious teacher, he said in his book, he said, the thing about Jesus is he not only preached the Sermon on the Mount, he seemed to actually live the values he taught in the Sermon on the Mount. So I would tell people, look, if you know me long enough, you'll know that I'm a flawed person and I might, I might disappoint you and the people in your church might disappoint you, but Jesus will not. Jesus, Jesus was accused of hypocrisy, but it was evident that he was not a hypocrite. I mean, I mean, imagine standing before your family on Thanksgiving or Christmas day and telling him who, who among you could point out a fault in my life. My, my family would laugh at me, but Jesus could stand before his critics and say, which of you can point to a sin in my life? I mean, not even Pontius Pilate could find fault with Jesus. 
So humans definitely have moral flaws. And hypocrisy seems to be part of the human condition. But not all hypocrisy is the same. There are people, unfortunately, who are in positions of Christian authority, and sometimes even within the field of Christian apologetics, who have seemingly lived a double life, that the moral principles that they taught, they were involved in things that were the opposite of that. But you know, I have a lot of friends in the clergy. I have friends who are Roman Catholic priests. I have friends who are Protestant ministers. I like to think of myself as being a very ecumenical person. I, I, I see myself as a peacekeeper. You know, Chad and Brian, the vast majority of people I know who are clergymen, they are very devout. Uh, they're very earnest. Uh, they work very hard. And I think that it's unfortunate that we come across people who do these terrible things. And unfortunately, they have a white collar on. But the vast majority of Christians I know, they really try hard to follow the Lord. And um, I think maybe one other thing that I would want to communicate is that at least in Christianity, when you, when you blow it and your hypocrisy is evident, everybody knows it because the Christian moral standard is so clear. Hmm. But in other worldviews, I'm not sure the standard of morality is so clear. But, you know, if you look at the Sermon on the Mount, you look at the Ten Commandments, you look at the Imago Dei, it's very clear that God has moral principles. And when we, when we violate them, people can call us out. But what about naturalism? What about other worldviews, religious worldviews? Where do they ground their morality? How do they develop the hypocrisy issue? So I, I think the idea that people are flawed, that's a fundamental biblical teaching, and it seems to correspond well to reality. Another thing you point out in the book, Ken, in that section, where you kind of offer some help for people who are wounded from hurts from, say, fallen Christian leaders and that sort of thing, maybe you could elaborate on how uh, uh, some of this because you t another table <laughs> is in that section and it uh, you know it's different uh, areas of spiritual renewal that can bring healing in those areas for me i've uh encountered those sorts of um uh disappointments and um things happening with leaders and you know you kind of have to go rebuild uh big sections of your soul and your thinking after that sort of thing happens and then depending on how close you are to those sorts of things and and just how the shock waves hit you um but what sort of um yeah. you know advice or uh, counsel would you give to people maybe there's i mean i'm sure there's people here listening who are familiar with um different uh public uh, figures who have taken huge falls and hurt the lives of countless so talk us through that if you would yeah, I, you know, uh, I talk a lot about the grace of God. I, I believe that the grace of God is the greatest thing in my life, that God sent his son to save me, that God loves me, and he's given me his unmerited favor. What I could never earn or deserve, he's given it to me. But in light of that, Brian, I also then challenge myself and say, you know, if I believe grace is the greatest thing in my life, then I need to be striving. I need to be working toward becoming a gracious person. You know, I would read 1 Corinthians 13, where Paul defines love. And boy, I thought, wow, here I am preaching on Sunday morning about God's grace. But I can be petty. I can be mean-spirited. And I, it, I really challenged myself to say, it's, it's not enough just for me to talk about these grand theological issues. I really, need to, I really need to be a person who is committed to things like grace and love, being patient with people. You know, I love what C.S. Lewis says, the, you know, 
forgiving the un- inexcusable in other people because God has forgiven the inexcusable in you. I mean, I've had people step on my toes in my church. But I also have to say, I've also had people say to me, boy, Ken, I'm kind of disappointed in you. You're not, you know, you're not nearly as gracious. What I, what I do want to say is, I don't know why the Lord has decided to take this sanctification process and make it long and, uh, and difficult. For, I mean, my Christian life sometimes seems like two steps forward, three steps back. Yeah. Um, what I do say in the book, Brian, is I, I think you need to be realistic. Uh, Christians are still not perfect people. You need to have realistic expectations toward uh, the people that you go to church with, that you worship with. I also bring them back again to this idea that, uh, don't forget, the Bible teaches human beings are fundamentally flawed. I've had Christians hurt me. But I am challenged because I know the Lord, even though I've hurt him and broken his commandment, he has forgiven me. And so, uh, you know, if you, if you decide to hold on to those hurts, it is very easy to become a very bitter person. But if you can, if you can begin to open yourself to God's grace and to forgive others, you can be renewed. Um, I talk about, I talk about things like prayer. I talk about things like reflection. I talk about maybe being part of groups where you can talk to people about some of the things that you find uh, difficult. And, and it, you know, it's true. Um, there are a lot of people who have been hurt and it's very hard for them to get back on the Christian horse and involve it with it again. But I still come back to the idea that I might hurt you. Chad might hurt you. Brian might disappoint you. I guarantee Jesus will not. Hmm. And he's the one that carries the real truth about Christianity. Jesus was no hypocrite. Mm -hmm. Thanks for those comments, Ken. And I would just want to encourage anybody who's listening at the moment. If you've gone through hurts and uh, wounds from from leaders, I would say, you know, uh, reach out to people if if you're hurting in those areas. Send an email to the podcast if you if you want. Um, podcast at apologetics three fifteen dot com. I've walked through a number of those situations, and one thing that I would want to share with listeners who may have gone through hurts or um, shattered um, ideas of uh, you know leaders who have fallen, forgiveness uh, is a real key to your healing. Forgiveness is essential to your healing. I would want to encourage you to, in that time of prayer, forgive. Ask the Holy Spirit to allow you to have um, a heart of forgiveness and to really pray for those people who have done you wrong. Pray the Holy Spirit give you a heart of forgiveness towards them and allow that spirit of forgiveness, if you will, to just flow out of you and pray for the betterment of that person and everyone that they've hurt or harmed. um, Let the love of the Holy Spirit flow through you and let that be an opportunity for healing to come. Because when you forgive and you pray for those other people um, and pray for those who've hurt you, it is really uh, not just a, a moment of healing for you, but it's also a moment of a restoring and a renewal. It has an opportunity for that. It's not pain-free. Um, there's probably going to be tears, but at the same time, there's an opportunity for something new to grow in the ashes. And you'll be amazed at the beauty of that thing that's able to grow in in an ash heap. Um, so be encouraged. Don't be embittered. If you hang on to that sorrow and if you hang on to bitterness, resentment, I've been done wrong, it is a poison to your soul and it will uh, will hinder your walk with Christ. It will open up doors for 
uh, unforgiveness or demonic influence in your life. You'll struggle with things that you uh, shouldn't be struggling with, and they'll, and your life will be like going against the grain of everything. Um, if you hang on to it, it'll be like poison. So I just pray right now for anyone who's listening that uh, they feel like that's that's their situation. I pray for healing over their heart, healing over their mind, and restoration to them. And I pray for that spirit of forgiveness just to be released over them, that they can release all bitterness and all um, heaviness to go from them. And uh, God, just uh, help them to find people to share this with, to pray with, and to be healed in this way. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, thanks for taking a moment, gentlemen. Um, mm-hmm. One thing I wanted to ask you, too, uh, along the lines of um, when you're talking about is Christianity good, you know, even going through difficult times, mm-hmm. you, you can kind of think about your book as responding to objections that Christianity isn't good. But at the same time, you know, you can make this huge case that um, in, the, in the midst of all the evil in the world and the terrible things going on, Wow, you can find the goodness of God in in the storms, yeah. in the difficulties, in the the pains, the unfairness, um, in inequality, or whatever you want to come up with. All the negative things. The amazing thing is that you can find the grace of God in it, yeah. uh, if you seek Him out. You know. So one of the things that Chad and I wanted to ask some more of our guests, and I would really be thrilled if you'd kind of go this route, Ken is if you were speaking to an unbeliever, maybe for some reason uh, someone's listening and they're not, you know, within the Christian apologetics community per se or or whatever, maybe they've kind of like, well, I still listen to this stuff, but I, I've rejected Christianity or something. If you're speaking to an unbeliever, what would be your case that God uh, is good, that Christianity is true, not necessarily from a an uh, intellectual standpoint, but if you were just speaking to them, as we were saying before the podcast, like around the barbecue, uh, yeah. it says, well, I, you know, Ken, I, I'd like to believe, but I just, I don't think, I, I don't think it's true. What kind of, would you be your response to that? Well, I appreciate that. And I, I appreciate both of you. I, it, it's always enjoyable for me to talk with Christians who are very sincere and forthright and uh, both of you guys are very humble and uh, I I really we need more of that in Christian ministry and Christian apologetics you know I I think what I might say is um, I'm really struck by this idea that Jesus comes along and he talks about God and he calls God father I mean the word father doesn't appear anywhere in the Quran you you don't you don't refer to Allah as Father, and even in the Hebrew context, it, it was almost uh, extraordinary that Jesus would refer to Yahweh Elohim, the Lord God Almighty, as Father. I I think what I would want to convey is that I think we see that in the biblical revelation we. We see a God that is very generous uh, in his creation, that God allows uh, people on planet Earth to enjoy all of the great benefits of living in a world that he created. And I, I, I also see uh, Jesus as uh, talking about this relationship that he has with the Father and with the Holy Spirit. and that. Uh, that the triune God is is a God of love. Uh, he doesn't, because they're a community of persons, John can say God is love. And God came into the world uh, to redeem people who had rebelled against him. And I believe that the, that, that grace that comes to us is, uh, is, is deeply generous. And I would simply uh I would simply say to somebody maybe who is skeptical or uh agnostic or uh, somewhere on the secular side that Jesus said if you seek me you'll find me if you seek with all of your heart 
And I, I would invite people, maybe people have stepped on your toes, maybe you've you've been a victim, maybe maybe you've never heard any good reason to believe in Christianity, but I don't think there's anybody like Jesus. I wrote a book a number of years ago, a God Among Sages, where I compare Jesus to Krishna, Buddha, Confucius, and Muhammad. I don't think there's anything like him. Um, and I think the grace and the love that comes to us through him, through his teachings, um, I think it's a one of a kind uh, love and grace. And so I would encourage you to, to open your heart and, and see if, if God does exist and if God hasn't become flesh uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, if my book can be of some help in that process, uh, boy, I'd be delighted. Thanks for listening to the podcast. If you have a question you'd like us to address or just a message for us, feedback, good or bad, you can either email us at podcast at apologetics315.com or leave a voice message for us using SpeakPipe. Just go to speakpipe.com slash apologetics315 to leave us a message. And remember, if you include a Ghostbusters quote in your question, we guarantee that we'll read it on the podcast. We also ensure up to 50% better quality answers. Also, if you've enjoyed today's podcast, please leave a review in iTunes or the podcast platform of your choice. And please share this episode with a friend if you found it useful. Remember, you can find lots of apologetics resources at apologetics315.com, along with show notes for today's episode. Find Chad's apologetics stuff over at Truth Bomb Apologetics. That's truthbomb.blogspot.com. This has been Brian Auten and Chad Gross for the Apologetics 315 podcast, and thanks for listening. Competition never waits. Take your gear on the go with a custom pack built to protect it, because any place can be an arena. Game on. The Tumi Esports Capsule, available on Tumi.com and select Tumi stores. It's never been easier to get outside with Academy Sports and Outdoors. Stop by your local Academy store in the northeast section of Northwest Highway at Skillman Street in Dallas. Or visit us online at academy.com and find everything you need for grilling, camping, biking, backyard fun, and more. Shop top brands like Pitbull, Swim, Hydroflask, Pelican, and the new Magellan Outdoors Pro. All at prices you'll love. With in-store and curbside pickup available now. And with Academy's wide selection of great gear, get ready to have fun out there with the whole family.